There we go. I think I have chat now. I just don't have people. <laughs> Yay, I've got chat though. Sorry about that. I just, the other day when we did this and there was no chat, I was sad because I don't know, I just felt a bit left out of the chat. Um, so thank you. I've, I've so, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to put out a new Christmas decoration yesterday and I didn't realise until afterwards. Um, so I've got my Mrs Claus outfit on today. <laughs> Yay, hello everyone in the chat. Yay, oh I'm pleased. That's made me happy. Um, uh, good, yeah, I... Uh, and it's really cold. Is anyone else just cold all the time? And I feel like we can't have the heating on 24-7 or... Anyway, um, thanks all for coming. And um, how's your Saturday been? It sort of still feels like a Saturday, in my opinion, even though all the days are the same in my life now. My husband has started just applauding random things that I do because I'm not coping well without gigs. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's going to be a long three months. I was thinking, though, as the New Zealand Comedy Festival has been cancelled and that was where I was supposed to be for the entirety of May, um, maybe I would just pretend I was in New Zealand for the whole of May and do everything. Oh, that's reminded me, actually. Um, oh, you, you're you not working from home today. Oh, well, I hope you're keeping safe outside, human hairball. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fun sentence to say. Um, please be safe. Um, what a little bit. Oh, good. You guys are lovely. Um, so I've had time to read over the first chapter that we'll be reading tonight. And I've made the executive decision because most of the first part of this chapter is Hamish and Sarah having like a, a conversation and it's quite fast flowing so I'm not going to do Hamish or Scottish just because I don't think I can do it and keep the actual storytelling good so I'm really sorry to anybody that's been enjoying the saga of the terrible Scottish accent but I'm just going to scrap that for today um because otherwise it's going to just be really stilted so um if you guys are ready yes five past now if people aren't here by now they're not coming are they Blumen peeps okay right uh, chapter 11. Go then, projected Sarah, tears streaming down her face. They snaked chinwards over her blotchy, sobruined skin and patchy makeup. Her right hand flew up wildly to brush them away, but the wine dulled her precision and she clattered her fingers into her teeth and lips. It stung and she blinked the pain away, trying to maintain her furious eye contact with Hamish. Hamish stood stock still in the darkness, watching her outline against the pale wall of the house. His feet felt too heavy to move, but his mind was racing. She was shaking, beaming her anger across at him through two dilated pupils and a quivering lip. There was a dull ache behind his own eyes as he fought the pressure of possible tears of his own. I don't want to go, was all he managed back in a half shout which petered out towards the end. What do you want then? She flung her arms about her sides. Do you just want to stick around making me feel like shit for the rest of my life? Stop making out like I have any kind of plan for this. I didn't engineer anything here, Sarah. I'm trying to deal with whatever this is exactly like you are. The beer was slurring his words, but he tried desperately to hold on to the vague point he thought he could make. I'm just trying to get through it with you. Except that you're not, are you? You're trying to make me feel bad every step of the way. I, and if you're not, then you're pretty good at achieving it with very little effort on your part. You've made your point tonight. Can I please just go to bed now? I'm tired. Her crying had escalated to swift, panicked sobs, with inelegant spluttering between them. Snot covered the back of her sleeve and there was mascara pooling in her collarbone. All right, Sarah, what have I done? What have I done other than try and make this work in the circumstances? Have you forgotten that I proposed to you? I wanted to marry you, Sarah. I asked you to marry me. Have you conveniently forgotten that in this version where I'm just trying to upset you? I'm not the one who didn't want to get married. I 
do want to get married, she screamed. Then why didn't you just say yes, like all the other girls who get proposed to by the guy they want to marry? Why didn't you throw your arms around me and say yes and start laughing and crying like I thought you would? You didn't give me enough time. How much time did you need? I thought it would be instant. Well, well, the candles went out. Well, I didn't blow them out. The heat behind his answers was well established now. The coals hot through and whitening around the edges. I know, but, but it happened, didn't it? And then the moment passed and you've just seemed so angry since. What do you want me to do? Ask you to do it again? Come on, Hamish, back inside the house. I'll set up all the candles straight out onto the bare wood for you. Stop going on about the damn coasters, you psychopath, he boomed at her. She fell silent instantly. I honestly don't think I know you at all sometimes. I used to think you were romantic, but now I guess you just must have been that kid who watches a Disney princess fall in love and flinches at the health and safety issues of the groom fighting a dragon in improper footwear. Oh, go to hell, she snapped. I just might. Depends. Guess that depends on what your mate Jesus thinks when we find him, doesn't it? I'll ask him to check his naughty nice list when we stumble across him in a little chef. I don't think we're going to find Jesus. Is that what you want? Is that better, Hamish? What? He stopped in his tracks, glaring scrutinously at her. Are you happy now? I don't think we're going to stroll out of Norton and come back arm in arm with Jesus Christ, son of God. Does that reinstate your faith in me? I'm not quite a stark raving lunatic as you have condemned me to be. I'm going to look for help, or to look for clues, or to look for something. I couldn't give a shit if it's Jesus or Allah or Ronald McDonald. I just want to find some help before the food runs out and people get into trouble. Why didn't you tell me you felt like that? Because ironically, you're so preachy. I don't want to listen to you mocking them anymore, mocking me and things that are important to me. I am part of this village, part of this parish, and part of a team at the moment, and I'm not going to let them down. If they want to call this expedition a hunt for Jesus, then fine. Make me a fucking t-shirt. I'll do it. Come or don't come. Do what you like, Hamish. She turned over her left shoulder and sloped up the stairs and into the house, pushing the unlocked front door open with her whole body weight and practically falling into the house. She felt sick from the emotional exertion and warm Sauvignon Blanc. Hamish was left standing in the front garden. It was one thing to have an alcohol-infused row on the way home from a huge night out, quite another to feel this destroyed after a few hours in a village hall. They should have left before it all got so out of hand. Before Mr Frinton recited the Jabberwocky and Beryl downed eight blue panda pops just to prove to Nigel that she could. They should almost certainly have left before the piggyback races around the room and if not then, they should definitely have left before the vicar convinced them to sing Islands in the Stream together. Oh, that's poignant today, isn't it? Hamish was no Kenny Rogers and the point of wine and the pint of wine Sarah had devoured to give her the confidence to become Dolly was currently being returned to the circle of life via the porcelain receptacle upstairs. Hamish trudged towards the front door, ready to lay his spinning head down. Tomorrow was going to be interesting. There we go, there's chapter 11. I honestly think in, I've, that was a good decision not to do that in Scott's <laughs> accent, because... Uh, um, I don't think I could I can either do the accent or give it yes Jeffers emotional intensity I can't do both <laughs> and I can't even do the accent at all so mm. yeah that's random I'd forgotten that that reference was in there oh, I'm sad we should all listen to him after this oh um right chapter 12 it really was a wonderful speech, Vicar, said Mrs. Shue kindly to the sagging vicar. Everyone thought so. The vicar winced at her in the violent sunshine and prayed for salvation from the internal beating that was hounding his senses. At some point during his night's sleep, his body had been overrun with homicidal creatures that were hell-bent on eating him alive from the inside out. Either that, or this was his first hangover in 24 years, second in his lifetime. 
The vicar had not been hungover since the day following his initiation to the university rowing team. Despite having drunk far more river water than alcohol during the various initiating ceremonial challenges, he had awoken the next morning to find himself paralysed by both alcohol consumption and actual paralysis. The 22-year-old not-yet vicar had roused himself in his dormitory bed and gone to swing his legs over the side in search of bacon. Finding his legs unresponsive, he'd tried to sit up and found that his entire lower body seemed to have fallen out with his brain. Being somewhat panicked at his lack of mobility, the young lad had called his biggest, strongest friend over and been fireman lifted to the university medical centre. The paralysis was caused by a stray disc from his spinal column, which had been ejected somewhere between the 8th and 14th beer funnel of the evening. Already a pious man and heavily sedated on various muscle relaxants, the vicar-to-be decided that this was a sign from someone much smarter than him that perhaps he should never drink himself into rigor mortis again. It seemed somewhat prophetic, therefore, that this second hangover and the apocalypse had so neatly coincided. He briefly wondered if any rowing had occurred in the interim period between waltzing with Mrs. Hamill and waking up in this fresh, dehydrated hell. Um, fun side note, that story is actually based on um, my actual freshers week at university, where I went out drinking with a guy called Mental Jimmy, and I drank about eight pints of snake bite, the lager cider with blackcurrant, and I am a five foot woman and at the time was very skinny. And I woke up the next morning, <laughs> I couldn't walk, I couldn't move my lower half, it slipped a disc, and then spent the first um, about three weeks, I think, of my university career on Cocodamol, completely unable to stay awake in lectures and just crying all the time <laughs> because it just made me cry and <laughs> feeling it was awful so I thought I'd steal it for the book anyway there you go fun fact bye although continued Mrs Shu in a voice that brought the vicar's focus crashing back into the room it did make me rather pleased that oh it did make me rather pleased that you have not chosen to put a musical portion into your sermons throughout the year that bit I could have done without although perhaps it would have seemed better if I knew who wham are Certainly some folks were loving it. Personally, I had to make do with the dance moves. Now that's where your talent lies, Vicar. That's where you've got grace. I never knew you were so light on your feet. And back. I'd really always assumed break dancing was for the much younger man. I think it might even be the first time I've seen a white man give it a go. The vicar decided to intervene, if not for the sake of UK race relations, then certainly to save his own dwindling dignity stores from the torrent of revelation erupting from an ever-eloquent Mrs Shoe. Yes, well, the Lord has blessed me with many passions and uh, talents. I don't know if blessed is the right word, dear, countered Mrs Shoe. You looked fairly tormented at times. I meant to ask you if it was possible to dance in tongues. Uh, yes, said the vicar swiftly. Yes, it is. Yes, but it's a very personal experience and not something it is well thought of to uh, discuss after an event. I should imagine it is an omen that this search for Jesus will go well. Mm -hmm. A divine omen. The vicar was fairly sure that if he didn't get a cold glass of water and a sun hat soon, he'd be spouting blessings to Jupiter and Mars. He felt dangerously close to inventing an extra god to explain away his own shortcomings territory. If he lived through this hangover and apocalypse, the vicar made a promise to himself to be more understanding towards those gods who'd likely been called in to into being to protect some historical spiritual leader from a previous incarnation of Mrs. Shu. Paganistic polytheism had never looked so good. He smiled at Mrs. Shu and walked briskly over to the largest clump of gathered villagers. Sarah and Hamish were stood in the middle, both had backpacks at their feet and nervous smiles on their faces. Every year the vicar waved off a group of very similarly dressed teens, but this trip was no Duke of Edinburgh award. This was the Prince of Men award. The vicar prayed inwardly to his recently birthed god of sherry-induced misdemeanours that he hadn't used that rather embarrassing Prince of Men award bit in his speech at the line dance. You two look fresh as daisies, said the vicar brightly. Thanks, vicar. Thanks, vicar. How are you feeling? Hang on, let's try some Scottish, shall we? Mm, how does Scottish go? Thanks, vicar. No, that's Irish. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh no, I can't remember what Scottish is. <laughs> Hang on, who do I think of when I think of Scottish? I have to say the word Sassanac to myself. <laughs> Listen to all the audio books of all of the Outlander series. I will, um, no, we just can't do Scottish today. I've lost that. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> It's been a long week. I'm so sorry. Okay, Scottish. Thanks, Vicar. How are you feeling yourself? replied Hamish. Excruciatingly glad I'm not joining you, said the Vicar in a low voice designed for Hamish's ears only. Hamish grinned and patted the Vicar gently on the back. Quite the party last night, wasn't it? What the fuck was that, Laura? <laughs> The two men smiled at each other and the vicar pondered for a moment whether it mattered that they were sending such a staunch atheist on the hunt for Jesus. Would it matter? Certainly in his heart the vicar felt Jesus would have as much time for those still doubting as those who filled his pews every Sunday. Perhaps agreeing to go in the first place would be enough of an affirmation of good willing to avoid eternal damnation. Which begged the question... Why was Hamish going? Purely for the love of Sarah, the vicar supposed? Was Hamish really expecting to find Jesus? Was anyone really expecting Hamish and Sarah to find a living, breathing human Jesus? Were they looking for a sign or a message? Commandments 2.0? The vicar didn't know, but there was no harm in looking. Are you all set then? Yeah, I think so, said Sarah. I suppose there's nothing really left to do but go. I suppose so, the vicar smiled, placed a hand kindly on Sarah's shoulder for a moment and then began a round of applause as Hamish took Sarah's hand and they headed out of the village towards the hills. It was a perfect scene, the vicar thought. Onwards for the Prince of Men expedition, bellowed Hamish into the distance. The vicar's insides quietly passed away. <laughs> Oh, this is definitely the episode with the most disastrous you know, accent, accent action, isn't it? Oh dear! See, an Irish accent I'm much better at. I can do, I can pretty much do an Irish accent, but Scottish blow me down if it doesn't fall out of my butt every time I'm not doing it. Um, how are you guys doing for time? Should we do one more chapter? My dinner's not ready yet. I feel like a jack. Oh, my dinner's not ready. Um, my corn nuggets aren't cooked yet. Does anybody else want to do another chapter? Um, we could do one more or we can um, leave the next chapter. I mean, there's going to be more chapters tomorrow. I've got nothing else to do, guys. Every now and again, I think like this has been a week and I now have no gigs until June and, and and then I have to squash that feeling down very hard. Yeah. All right. One more chapter. Cool. OK, one more. And then I better go and eat my hash browns. Hmm. Which Irish one am I best at? Southern Irish, I think. I'm not bad in an Irish accent, I think. Is this Southern Irish? It's not Northern Irish, is it? Northern Irish is where it's all a little bit tighter and hard. Twitter and that's what she said I I think is this a good Irish accent maybe it's not even a good Irish accent but I'm definitely better at it than I am at Scottish that's all I know anyway and uh, once when I was at uni we did a production of um uh what's it called the Lieutenant of Inishmore and I had to learn like a really specific Irish accent for that, um, the Isle of Arran accent. So she's almost like verging on South African. Ooh. Anyway, should we do some more story? This is so lovely, by the way. Thank you for like coming to this because it just does make me happy. Um, OK, maybe I can't do an Irish accent looking at your comments. Oh, fine. <laughs> I won't become a voice a voiceover artist after all. Damn it, that was one thing I was going to be able to do from my new job in my house. Ooh. Right, chapter 13. Let's do one more. Lightning flashed across the turbulent purpling sky. Rain was whipping across the gr grass, fleeing the four corners of the earth and tumbling sideways across the faces of our intrepid explorers. They were soaked. Water seeping in through cuffs and collars, running down every crevice of skin and sliding off soaked hair down frowning faces. They were hunched over, battling through the relentless torrent of cold water that drove into them from all directions. Hamish watched Sarah fervently for signs of fatigue. He was worried. 
Back in the village, it had all seemed like a merry adventure, like Lord of the Rings, but with a significantly less attractive cast. Now they were out and the weather had only got worse as the light failed, he felt like an idiot. He wanted to say useful things like, let's just get to that bend in the path and then we can bed down for the night. But there was no bend in the path because there was no path. Where were they going? If they had bumped into his own mother right at that point and she'd asked where they were going, he didn't think he'd have been able to reply without wincing. We're looking for Jesus. We think he might be lost. It was a fool's errand. After a lifetime of pitying people who were blindly fumbling after an invisible god, he suddenly found himself in Wellington boots and a wax jacket, eagerly hunting down the fairly elusive heir to the throne of heaven. Wasn't Jesus supposed to be seeking them out? How hard could that be when you have an all-powerful dad? If he couldn't even navigate Exmoor, then what hope was he going to be in getting them all safely across the sticks? He tried to shake the scorn from his mind and ended up doing an excellent impression of an enthusiastic soggy dog. He promised himself to keep his mouth shut. Sarah was right, even if he was still too proud to say it to her. There was no harm in going out to see what lay further afield from the village. No one was actually looking for Jesus. They were looking for help and it just so happened that whatever help they found would be attributed to Jesus regardless of his lack of actual intervention. They had decided to head east, largely because they already lived in the southwest and the welcoming committee had agreed that realistically Jesus was unlikely to be in Cornwall. Nowhere in the Bible did it say that he was partial to a pasty and some surfing. Hamish privately thought that Cornwall was likely to be exactly where Jesus was. Wasn't that where all posh kids go on their holidays while they're saving up for the all-important gap year in India? For some reason, he was fairly sure he wouldn't like a modern Jesus, even if they could find him. Jesus would have casual hours with good money working for his dad. Jesus would sort of shop at Super Dry and have hair with natural highlights. The sort of boy that was born already knowing the intricate details of a rugby match and who had an uncle with a steady supply of tickets to events where girls with impossibly straight hair would fawn all over him. Not that Hamish had thought about it. There wasn't much of an argument not to head east. It was as good a place to look as any. The oddest thing about the trip so far was the complete lack of seeing anything. Hamish hadn't seen evidence of a single other person since they had left Norton Fitzwarren. For the first few miles, he'd been incredibly glad of it. He felt he might strangle in cold blood if he were to hear the word volivant again. In, if his navigating was right, they should be nearing a town he had briefly lived in when looking for a house to move into with Sarah. It should be just on the other side of the hill they were currently crossing. There were no signs of life yet. No lights in the distance. Hamish assured himself it was either just the smothering density of the rain or the apocalypse-induced blackout that meant he couldn't see it. A whole town couldn't have just been wiped off the map, could it? They'd only passed a few buildings so far and all three had been abandoned. Empty shells were better than corpses though and Hamish was choosing to believe they'd left their homes voluntarily to find company. It was hard enough knowing what to do when you were part of a village, let alone if you lived this isolated. The world was different without human lights and human sounds. Hamish hoped it wouldn't be disorientating enough to stop him finding his way back. I'm getting tired, Sarah called back to him. What? Sarah, I didn't hear you. I'm getting tired. I'd like to stop for a bit. Sarah's voice came back through the river of air between them. Of course, of course, we'll stop now. Sarah looked very small in the chaos of the weather. He scanned around them for somewhere a little more sheltered. There was an old oak bowing to the might of the storm a hundred yards or so away, looking as though it regretted not backing Thor back when it had the chance. Over there, we'll, we'll go for that tree. Aren't you meant to avoid trees in a storm? shouted Sarah. I can't remember, he yelled. It's either there or, well, anywhere, he waved vaguely across the bare meadow. Okay, tree it is then. I haven't seen any lightning anyway. They trudged through the soggy earth towards the lonely oak. What is that under it? She was pointing ahead of them. Oh, God. <laughs> I thought I was doing too much hand acting. I just punched the laptop. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what? What is that under it? She was pointing ahead of them, signalling for him to look. 
What's that? He followed the direction of her arm to a dim lump ahead of them on the ground. He took a few steps closer to her. Looks like a rock, he struggled over the noise of the wind. Yeah, a rock. Is it a rock? Sarah sounded nervous. Yeah, I guess so, he said lamely, wondering why, after all the Brad Pitt films he had watched over the years, he couldn't seem to conjure an ounce of testosterone when the moment asked for it. What else could it be? Oh, sorry, was that, was that, so sorry, guys, <laughs> because we're sitting at my um, makeup table where I draw all over my face and um, and the laptop doesn't quite fit on it, so it's hanging over the edge and I punched it. I'm very sorry. I'll try and keep jumpiness to a minimum. Oh, it's tense, this, isn't it? <laughs> was the book tense? No, but the idiot reading it was. Um <clears throat> So they're heading towards the rock. Okay, shall we keep going? She wanted to stop walking towards the rock if she could engineer it, but didn't quite know how to tell Hamish she was frightened of a rock. Why wouldn't we? Hamish channeled Brad and put his head down towards the rock. Personally, Sarah thought there were lots of reasons why they wouldn't, but she didn't want to sound stupid. And the only question she wanted to ask was whether they were absolutely certain there were no bears in England. If the apocalypse ever ended, she was going to make sure she never took the instant information age for granted again. What she wouldn't give for an iPhone access to Wikipedia's list of British flora and fauna right now. Hamish took Sarah's hand, grateful to be able to appear manly, whilst also finding the solace of her skin that he so rarely forgot to marvel at. She had perfect skin. They hadn't been naked together since the apocalypse. Ooh, bit racy. He missed it. He missed the way she hooked one leg across him and he could feel her warmth on him. He forced himself to stop thinking about it. There was no way he could fight anything well enough to protect them without an erection, let alone with one. Perhaps if the rock turned out to be a marauding bear or wolf, it would be frightened enough at the sight of a protective erect male human to just think it wasn't worth the fight. Did bears carry rape alarms? There are no bears in England, he muttered to himself, and felt Sarah squeeze his hand. Thank you, she said, smiling at him quizzically. He was about to ask what for, but then realised she was pleased with him and he had no desire to change that. He felt like she was on his side and he hadn't truly felt like that since before the clock stopped ticking. They edged closer to the lump on the ground. It wasn't moving, but the closer they got, the less certain Hamish felt that it could possibly be a rock. It just didn't look solid enough. It looked like it was rippling slightly in the wind. Some kind of blanket? They were just over two metres away when the lump on the ground stirred and a man appeared from under a blanket. He sat up and looked straight at them. Sarah and Hamish froze solid. Hamish and Sarah, said the stranger, his voice seemed very distinctive to look at. His voice seemed distinctive to look at. No, it didn't, you balmy tart. His face, his face, I can't read. His face seemed very distinctive to look at. But you also felt like you wanted to always be looking in case you forgot what it looked like after you turned. Let me read this whole sentence again. I'm sorry, I've biffed it. His face seemed very distinctive to look at. But you also felt like you wanted to always be looking in case you forgot what it looked like after you turned away. Yes, Sarah found her voice first. Jesus. The word hung in the air. Hamish knew instantly that she was right. Sarah was always right. The three figures stood in the storm and looked at one another. Despite the wind and the rain and the thunder, it felt like the silence might break Hamish's eardrums. Millennia passed between them as they stood in their tiny triangle. Finally, Jesus spoke. Well, thank home you found me. I was worried sick. I'm not really cut out for mountaineering. This weather is worse than crucifixion. Is worse than crucifixion. Yes, I'm allowed to make that joke. What is this weather? No wonder we never started with England last time. This is lousy. I don't know how you get anything done. Hamish's jaw dropped. Any tiny part of his mind that might have been forming a plan immediately creased. Ceased. <laughs> Oh, fucking hell, Laura. Immediately ceased. He had not expected this. Jesus looked from Sarah to Hamish and back again. He had an awful feeling he'd just failed spectacularly to make a good first impression. Sorry, let me start again, he smiled broadly. Hi, I'm Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, said Hamish. Got it in one, said Jesus chirpily. Shall we head off?
There we go. Oh, I'm so sorry I can't read. Every time there's a good sentence, I get too excited at me liking the sentence and then I can't read it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so sorry about punching the laptop. Oh, did you guess? Did you think that they were going to find him? Um, grown up prods. Did you think? Yeah, okay. Oh, I hope it's not too. Um, oh, I hope you don't guess the whole plot. Um, yeah, so they found Jesus or, or a man claiming to be Jesus. Which one could it be? Um, this was fun. Thanks, guys. It's giving my day some structure. I've really enjoyed it. No, oh, you like bar me up. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm trying not to swear too much um, in this because I know some people don't like it. Not that my mum's watching them, but um, eh, anyway, uh, lovely. Well, have a nice Saturday evening. Um, thanks for coming along. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be back tomorrow, eight o'clock again tomorrow. Is that all right with you guys? Eight o'clock. All right. Um, keep safe. Lots of love. Bye.